just look at the way. To sort and analyze cells, blood cells, etc., mammalian cells, are these giant, expensive machines called flow cytometers or fax machines, fluorescence activated cell sorters. And you can see how big this machine is already. Here's a computer screen. Um, it's, a, it's not a portable machine, it's by no means cheap, anywhere from half a million to a million dollars. Uh, you have to use uh, sheath fluid and a separate cart like this just to run the machine. So, you crack one of these open. Basically, all it is is a laser or a couple lasers shining on the cells that flow through the air. And then it uses inkjet technology to deflect the, shell, the cells and then make their collection tubes. <coughs> like I said, these, these are big machines, they're expensive, they're very complicated, and that you need to hire uh, an outside technician usually to run the machine for you if you have one of these. They're very hard on the cells. They're shooting them really fast. They're streaming into the air. The, the cells don't like this. They're limited in their applications right now. They can really only sort or analyze the cell based on fluorescent signatures or optical scatter signatures. <coughs> and they can't handle small samples, like just a couple cells or a couple or a droplet of cells. <coughs> so what we want to do, we want to make this dream medical product, this uh, portable cell sorting device, cell analysis device that's simple, inexpensive, and like I said, portable. We want to be able to bring this thing anywhere, have it do anything, um, analyze cells on a variety of parameters, do cell counts like, like the flow set timers do now, and sort cells like the, the fax machines do now. And ultimately why I got into this, uh, personally I wanted a, a method to sort healthy cells from cancer cells, and I'll talk about that later. But that, that was my original motivation to get into this project to begin with. So the, to make something that's portable and simple and cheap like this, uh, we need to use small technology like microfluidics and, in our case, optical traveling with solid state or diode lasers. <laughs> so the way we manipulate our cells is with optical traveling in microfluidic systems. So optical traveling, basically what you see here is a laser shining on a small cell the laser is simply moving around and that cell is moving around with it. Optical trapping offers us cell manipulation uh, capabilities that aren't available in flow cytometers right now, like cell deformability, the, the ability to stretch your cell and look at it that way, which I'll talk about later in my talk. <coughs> since, since it's an optical technique, it complements well with what's currently available where they use lasers and <coughs> optical techniques to sense the cells and to count the cells. And um, optical trapping also allows us to eliminate that entire sheet fluid cart that you saw in the first picture of the flow cytometer. And you can actually use the optical trapping to focus your cells and send them where you want to be. Lasers currently have become very cheap and very small, like this laser pointer here. So laser trapping, which is how we use, how we uh, manipulate our cells, <coughs> basically to, to understand it, you just have to remember that light has momentum, and a change of momentum creates a force. So that's that's physics one right there. <coughs> so because there's an index of refraction mismatch between your cell or your particle and the medium it's in, you get a change of direction with the rays of light that come into your, your cell, and thus you get a change of momentum of the light, and you get a force around the particles. <coughs> so currently, there's, there's two models really to describe the forces on the cell, the bulk forces of the entire cell, where the cell is going to go, and that's basically split into small cells, or, this, or small particles where the particle is much smaller than the wavelength of light you're using, or large particles where the particle is much larger than the wavelength of light you're using. And those are defined as the regular regime for small particles and the meter regime for large particles. So in the regular regime, basically you're looking at the gradients of the intensity over the cell. That is encountering your cell or your particle. And what you get, the way to describe it, is uh, you get two forces on your, on your particle. As your, your beam of light comes in, it pushes your cell with a gradient force that's perpendicular <coughs> to the direction your light is traveling, and a scattering force, which is parallel to the direction the light is traveling. So your gradient force, just so you're math really quick here, uh, goes with the, the size of your particle to the third, and the scattering force goes with the size of the particle to the sixth. So if you follow this model and assume that it works for all size particles, when you get to large particles, large particles, this model says that particles just get blasted out of the laser, and this doesn't happen. Um, for large particles, they still trap and they still experience these forces just as you would expect. So you need a different
different model for those particles. And that currently is the ray optics approximation, which is basically ray tracing through your particle. Again, you have a gradient force and a scattering force that simply comes from vectors. Uh, you've got a, a scattering force, the direction with the laser, and a gradient force perpendicular to the laser. And you can remodel the forces over the entire particle just by tracing the rays of light through your particle. So this works for large particles in the area that we're interested in, like cells. Um, uh, the current models, like I said, are, are pretty much only for the bulk forces on the, on the, the cell of the particle. So it, it tells you where, where your particle is going to go, but it doesn't tell you what forces are, are really felt on the surface of the particle. So what we did in my thesis and in this talk, we modified this model to make it more applicable to what we're doing. <coughs> So we simplified the model. When they, when they originally did this, the, the optical traffic modeling, they used really high numerical aperture um, rays coming into your particles. So basically, that's, that's a really large angle of rays that you have to model over your entire particle to get the force on your particle. They also, we also, in our model, we're using lower NA, so we assume parallel rays coming into our particle throughout the entire, entire particle. So it simplifies our model a lot more, so we can do more with it. Uh, we also we incorporated an intensity distribution in our model, so we can change the shape of the light interacting with our particles if we so see fit, which I'll, I'll talk about later when I talk about the bar trapping. <coughs> and finally, this, this new modified model allows us to model the surface forces over the particle, which is not, was not currently available with too many models very accurately before. Um, this allows us a simple way to do that, which will be more advantageous later in my talk. So on the front, front surface of, the of our particle is showing you in 3D what our, our modeling system looks like, and I'll get back to modeling really quick here so we can get some more interesting stuff. But um, originally what they did was Gaussian beams, just, just a round beam like, like you see coming out of this laser pointer. Incident on the front of this particle, you can see the highest intensity forces are in the middle where the beam is. Uh, the beam is just slightly off-centered, so we're actually getting a force on the particle, and it, it fades off to lower, lower intensity and lower forces away from that center of focus. <coughs> you can also model the backside of our, our system, or of our particles, get the backside forces. And finally, if we integrate over the entire particle, again, we get back those uh, gradients and scattering forces over our entire particle, but also we can get the front surface and back surface forces, so we can see what it's doing to the entire particle as we are stretching it. I'll talk about later. <coughs> so um, we, we showed this model and we'd like to verify that it actually works. So we simply took uh, published data where they modeled the forces on the particles <coughs> and actually measured the forces on the particles and we just compared our data. And it, it's pretty close, it's not perfect, but again, we want a simple model that was easy to use and really quick. So our model works well for traditional optical trapping. And in traditional optical trapping, the way they manipulated lots of particles and large area particles first was scanning laser optical trapping, or SLOP. Um, so originally what they did, they took a single laser, a single Gaussian beam, and basically jumped back and forth from particle to particle to create shapes like this. They had to, had to get back to that first particle until it started to flow away from where it was supposed to be. <coughs> so really, this technique it can manipulate a lot of particles, but it's limited in the scalability. You have to get back to that first particle before it flows away, and it's it's really limited in how many particles you can store and how big of an area you can store. So it's a really simple technique, but it's not very scalable. Contrast to that is holographic optical tweezers. In holographic optical tweezers, they take that same round Gaussian beam and they send it through a, a spatial light modulator or an LCD, and basically sh change the shape. They uh, they do phase and amplitude modulations in the beam, <coughs> they create areas of higher intensity and lower intensity, and they can manipulate up to maybe 400 particles at the same time. 